Okay, I think we are live and kicking. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. Welcome back for the last class, at least of this round, of Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, January 26, 2016. Come on in. Good to see you all. Is it 27 today? Well, all day. All day, okay. Well, Joe at the desk, at the dinner desk, told me it was the 26, so, oh well. I had, I had no idea on that. 25, 26, 27. When you're moving, the dates just kind of roll together. Anyway, but uh, glad to see everybody today. So glad that you are here and that y'all have been uh, with us through uh, this course. Uh, I know everybody hasn't been able to make every session, so let me just remind us again that uh, on the church's website, um, there is a link. It's a little hard to find. Um, I find, and I don't remember what the tab it's under, education maybe? It's under media. Media, that's and it. Wednesday night. Yeah, and the Wednesday night. And then that's the only one there at the moment. Uh, so, and then that links you to a YouTube channel. Uh, and you can either sign up for the First Baptist Fredericksburg YouTube channel or just listen to it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you sign up or not, but if you do, then I guess extra bells and whistles come along or something. <laughs> I have never quite understood that. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, the, the uh, audio recordings are uh, of a decent quality. Um, they're definitely audible, um, which is good if you're an audio recording. And uh, sadly, no visual. We haven't cracked the code. I guess we're not technologically advanced enough to scroll through the slides as the the voice goes along i would love to get to that now ultimately of course we hope to have video but we're uh, very far away from that for the regular classes they of course uh, film sunday mornings uh, but i've spoken to the powers that be and we're just not there uh, in terms of the equipment and the manpower just yet and it makes sense when it was all explained to me so uh further now we have the audio but please feel free to go back and listen to those i think they'll have them up for a while um, and if there's any friends or family that is interested in this and interested in our, the godly roots of our country, please send that link to them. So they don't have to go digging around the website, but just once you find it, copy that link and send it on. I've sent it to several friends and several family members that live in different parts of the country that have started listening. So um, feel free to share it. It's here for us all. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Uh, this uh, is part two for What is My Role? Uh, the title of our last chapter, chapter 10, segment 10, however you want to call it. Um, and coincidentally, we have 10 points. Uh, we covered five of those last week, so I'll just review those uh, very quickly. Um, and we'll do the second five uh, tonight, which probably won't take as much time. And then I would like to open it up for just kind of a general discussion um, of what thoughts you have from the course, uh, current events, and um, ways that we can go forward. These are, this is not an exhaustive list of things that we can do, but it is a start. It's a beginning. Just like this whole course, there was so much more that could have been included, and I have had lots of extra notes that just wasn't in time to uh, include. And also, you've all been very kind and very patient as this was the first run for this particular course. So as I go back and review it, um, I'm sure I'll find ways to augment it and uh, hopefully improve it as well for future uh, times because I would love to teach this again. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, and I appreciate all of you very much um, in being here uh, throughout this last uh, four or five months. So with that said, uh, last week we covered a number of issues that we need to have in mind if we are serious about making a difference in our country our God-given country. And the first, and we looked at uh, several scriptures uh, backing this up, is to ask ourselves, how are we, what is our standing before God? Are we right with God? Because the scriptures t tell us in Proverbs that a man's, view are in the, uh, a man's ways are in the full view of the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles 7.14, one of our key scriptures for this course, uh, we are instructed to, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will bless them and heal their land. So the first step is that we have to humble ourselves and turn to, the God, turn to God and turn if there's any sin or wicked ways in our lives that are impeding the blessing in our lives 
and in those around us, then let's get right before God. That's, of course, step number one, the obvious step number one. But then step number two is kind of like it, because that is to pray for others, uh, to pray for our families, for our friends, for our church members, and for our leaders, uh, the pastor of our church, those who are in leadership positions here, but, of course, also in our leaders in our community, our municipal and county leaders, our state leaders, our national leaders. And we talk about them, and usually in terms of what their failings are, many times, uh, you know, it seems to be human nature that we do that. We're all guilty of doing that. But how much do we actually pray for them on a daily basis? So uh, this, the second step was to pray for our friends, for our families, for our leaders, for those that we really care about, for God to make a difference in their lives, as God has made a difference in each of our lives, and I know He has, and we could all stand up and give testimonies to the, the impact, the positive impact that God has made. Uh, step number three is the corollary to step number two, which is don't complain against the leaders. And we read three different scriptures in Exodus, Acts, and Ecclesiastes that tell us God is not pleased when we criticize and we complain about our leaders and just go on and on. And that is the easiest thing in the world to do. And we're all guilty of that. And I'll raise my hand first. <laughs> but God is not pleased with that. And He says, don't do that. Pray for them. Don't criticize them. Don't run them down. Don't complain about them all the time because it runs us down. That... Uh, diminishes our view of, of things and that takes faith out of the equation because it's only by faith that we please God. And so we need to believe that God will intervene supernaturally in others' lives, whether there's those around us or whether those are in positions of leadership all the way up to the national level. And so when we get out of the business of judging them, because basically that's what we're doing is assuming the judgment throne and we're passing judgment upon them, and it may be a valid judgment, but it's not our role. That's not to say that we sit by and just say, oh, everything's fine, like a little Pollyanna. We need to evaluate things realistically. But that's different than just complaining and complaining and complaining. And uh, Pastor Tommy uh, last fall taught a very good series on that as well. I don't have my little smiley button from that. Uh, gave it to my daughters, and they had a great time until they lost them along with lots of crayons and other things that are scattered hither and yon. Number four was educate ourselves. And we are to educate ourselves just as we're doing in this course, to find out about God's principles, what I've been calling the universal principles of human governance, just like the uh, laws of nature that govern nature and physical matter, such as gravity and lift. There are universal laws, and we've talked about those but we need to know about those. We need to be educated on those and not just be so focused on this, the here and now and whatever's trending on the news today and then have that just disappear from our brains. And so we need to continue to learn, just as the founders did, more of God's principles not only for our lives, but what are God's principles on governance of a nation? Because we're part of a nation. We don't just exist as, you know, the old saying, no man is an island. Very few of us are. We live in community. And God created us that way, to live in community with one another. And that's a good thing. And we can benefit one another. And our standard of living is much higher when we do. And so we need to find out the best way to live in that community. And God's ways as I'm sure that we will all agree, are the best ways. But we have forgotten that. We're not being taught that in school. And many times we're not taught that in church because that's just kind of a different thing that we just don't really focus on. Uh, because we bought in the line of the separation of church and state, which means that in the church we never talk about the state. But we are the state. It's a subset of we the people. And as such, it's our business. It's our responsibility. And as such... We need to know about it. We need to know what God says and not just what God says about our individual lives. And we tend to focus on that, not on the broader community. And I'm calling that the community, not only Fredericksburg and Gillespie County, but the nation as a whole. That's our community. I saw an article recently. The Barna Group had done a study of people who were professing Christians, and they asked them simple questions like, 
name some of the Ten Commandments or name some mm-hmm. of the uh, apostles or, uh, you know, um, were Sodom and Gomorrah husband and wife? <laughs> Questions like that. <laughs> and a staggering number of professing Christians mm-hmm. got all of them wrong. Uh, it's amazing. Well, and I think that same group said that the epistles were the wives of the apostles, right? (laughs) Yeah, that is amazing. That that truly is amazing. And it's across the board. Our entire nation has has drifted that way. Uh, And so it's time for the wake-up call, and it's happening all over this nation. What we're doing right now is happening all over the nation. God is shaking His people, His church, and saying, wake up. And people are waking up. And that's good news. Because we are waking up and we're saying, oh, wait, wait. we've been asleep at the switch for a long time. And we need to rediscover these, just as we talked about with uh, the young King uh, Hosea. Hosea. Yeah, okay. Josiah. Josiah. Thank you. Thank you. I knew I wasn't saying that right. <laughs> it's been a hard several days moving. Anyway, uh, when he discovered God's law, And they didn't know. And I feel like we're in a similar type of age. And so we need to do that. And after we do, that's not it. It's not just to fill up ourselves, but then we need to influence others. We need to share this great knowledge that God is bestowing upon us and and waking us up to. Because these truths are what? Self-evident. That means they can be discovered. They are discoverable. They're not hidden and locked away in a vault. They are discoverable. God allows us to. If we seek Him, we shall find Him. When we find Him, we find His ways, His laws, because He wants to reveal that to us, His children. And as such, we need to know that, and then we need to share it. It's not just for ourselves. We need to benefit others in this community that God has called us to be a part of. And so, as we do, then, it's like the old uh, analogy of the candle, and then you light your neighbor's candle, and then another candle, and another candle, and then it still really starts to glow. It's not just a few little uh, flames here and there. And that's where we need to be right now. And that is part of our God-given responsibility of living in a free nation. We can't just fall asleep at the switch. We have an active role to play. And that's a very big part of our active role. Now I have set my little clicker somewhere. Oh, here it is. All right. Number six, stay informed. After we learn God's biblical truths, the universal laws of human governance, as I like to call them, then we need to apply that. Because it's not not just enough to know it. We need to make it practical application. Now, this course is all about knowing and understanding the rules of the game, if you will. God's playbook. And once we do, then let's put it into action. It's not just sharing it with others, but then we need to apply it to the situation. So we need to next, number six, stay informed. Find out what the issues of the day are so that we can weigh in. And we can let our voice be heard intelligently, not ignorantly, like so many are today. And it's a collective failing or negligence that we've had just as a nation and as the church, as the body of Christ in the nation. Familiar scripture, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We don't know what's going on, and we're not able to discern it. We may hear it in news blurbs, little Twitter feeds, but that doesn't really tell us what's going on. It doesn't tell us how to interpret it and to understand it, because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of twists, a lot of spins. There's a, a lot of spin zone going on, and it can be very, very confusing, because there's very clever people that like to spin it in different ways. But if we have God's truth in us, then we will be able to unspin that and see what it really is. What's what's the bottom line here? And that's part of our responsibility as believers. Because we have the lens of the Word of God and God's Spirit in us, then we can interpret these things. And we can see, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? And if it is a bad thing, we need to be able to articulate why is that a bad thing. Because, for example, that would lead to more of a state sovereign model, and that ignores God and kicks God out of the equation. Now, that's just a very broad example, but we could talk about um, specific situations. But in general, that is the principle behind this, so that we can apply it to everyday situation. 
as I've begun digging into this and had my own eyes opened up a lot more uh, with regard to God's Word in this setting, in this, in this sense, then I'm able to discern a lot more. For example, a lot, the, a lot of the presidential debates going on right now. And to discern what's really truth and what is a wrong direction of what a lot of the candidates are proposing. So we discussion recently. Bernie Sanders is obviously an avowed socialist. Right. Someone was asking me, well, doesn't the Bible say that in the early days the Christians all got together and sold what they had and everybody shared as they as they needed together? Isn't isn't that what Bernie Sanders is looking for? Isn't he the only one following a Christian model? <laughs> <laughs> right, that and and that is an old argument. Um, that was made. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And to forcibly take everything away from everybody and then redistribute it as as they like. Uh, no. It's uh, uh, unfortunately and, and sadly that argument has actually sucked a lot of Christians in, thinking, well, oh yeah, I guess that's right. It's completely wrong. But but I appreciate you mentioning that. Number seven. Let your voice be heard. As we are educated in God's ways, as we apply this knowledge to current events, that's not enough either. We need to then have our voice be heard. Not only within our communities, but we need to inform those who are in decision-making positions of what our views are. Again, we the people are the ones with the stated power, according to the Declaration of Independence, according to the Constitution. We are the ones who have instituted the government, given the government specific roles, not every role, not everything, specific roles. And it is our job as we the people to make sure that that river stays in its banks. So we need to inform. It is our job, our duty, our responsibility to inform those who are going out of their banks, going outside of what their realm of responsibility is. We are required to do that if we're going to live in a free country and keep it on course as it was originally designed to do. There's a tendency in human government, and you can see examples of this all throughout the, since the beginning of history, when people started collecting together, for government to grow. It's like moss, cobwebs. <laughs> I'm cleaning out my garage right now. It just naturally grows. It just, and I, I don't know why that is, but it is. It's a, it's a well-known phenomenon. And so if it's not kept in check, it will grow on its own. It will expand. Bureaucracies just mushroom. And they just grow, and they're self-perpetuating. And they want more power, more responsibilities. There is so much overlap amongst all the different aspects not just in the branches but all the even within branches there's so much out, uh, overlap because everybody wants to control everything it's just a human nature and when you push god out of the equation and have it as a state sovereign model then people begin to believe well yes the state has to take care of this because we are responsible for that and we can't leave it up to the people they don't know what to do they're lost. We've got to take care of this for them. And that mentality just gets into people and it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And it'll grow to no, to no end if we allow that. But the founders knew that and they warned us. And we are required by our sovereign charter to keep a handle on this and to stay involved. Now just as a little side note, I just want to mention One of the kind of afterthoughts I had that I didn't uh, make as strongly as possible. That I've talked about the founders a lot. And I believe that God used our founders very instrumentally in forming a unique nation, one nation under God. I believe that with all my heart. A lot of the debate for the last 20 or 30 years, I've noticed, is on the lives of the founders. Instead of focusing on God's principles, 
a debate is, are they a Christian or weren't they a Christian? Are they a serious Christian or are they just kind of an atheist or agnostic or a deist? And the whole debate's, debate's gotten shifted. Whether that was intentionally or not, I don't know. But I feel like it's just gone off to a sidetrack. And that's really beside the point. I mean, there's some validity in that. It's one of those things that there's enough validity that you kind of think, well, you, maybe you need to focus on that. But that's not the main point. Because where in the Bible, aside from Jesus Christ himself, was there a perfect person? None. Look at Moses, one of the most fantastic people. Look at David as we're going through the series right now. And they made mistakes. Moses tried to take his role on himself and he killed a man. And was driven from his home in Egypt for it. Had to live in the desert for 40 years. We can go on and on and on about the lives of those in the Bible and the lives of the founders of this nation and show where their human frailties were, but we'd have to look at our own lives as well because we're all humans. But that doesn't mean God doesn't do wonderful things through us, and God does that. And so let's not be sidetracked by this argument that goes back and forth and just focuses on the lives of the founders. And I think there's, there were many wonderful, dedicated Christians that were the vast, vast majority of those in the founding generation of our country. And I believe they were being led by the Holy Spirit. But even some, like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin that we've talked about, that eh, maybe they were kind of deist or, you know, there's a God somewhere and I kind of respect Him, but I don't really know Him. And Jesus Christ, I'd, maybe, I'm not sure. And we kind of get all wrapped up in that. But that's not the main point. And as I've, I've been looking at lots of different materials, I'm amazed how much is, attention is focused just on that. Uh, let's not get sidetracked with that because God has never used perfect people because there are no perfect people. But that doesn't mean God can't use us as He's used people all throughout history. And I believe that He will use us because all that He is looking for, all He's looking for is a willing heart. Not a perfect heart, but a willing heart. And that's also what this class is about, is finding out about what God says and then making ourselves available and letting God use us where He would have us, where the avenues that He's created for us individually as unique individuals. So let's let our voice be heard. It's our birthright as Americans and it's our responsibility. It's two sides of the same coin. We get to do that. Not everybody does around the world. Not everybody has that possibility. In some countries, they would throw the letters away. They wouldn't even open them. We get to do that. And we are supposed to do that. But how many times do we actually do that? Now, I'm not asking for a raise of hands, but we don't. By and large, we don't. And so the few handwritten letters or typed letters with original signature on it, they actually take to heart because there's so few that go out there. And especially in today's electronic age of, of tweets and emails, it's so easy just to jot something off, but that's not taken nearly as seriously as actually writing a letter saying, you're looking at this issue right now, this is what I believe, and this is what the people in my community believe. Today, another thing that is hampering this is we are busy. It seems like we are busier than ever. Doing what, I'm not sure, but we're doing a million things. I say not do, doing what, I'm not sure, because, you know, at the end of the day, we're exhausted, and what have we done today? I don't know, but I've been running here, and I've been running there, and, I mean, it was that kind of day for me today, too. And we're just so busy, 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 busy. But do we really carve out and dedicate time to do the most important things? To do, have our prayer time each day, to do our Bible study each day, check in with God, to write our representatives, maybe write a family member. How many of you like to go to the mailbox and get mail, but you get bills? <laughs> How much personal correspondence do we get anymore? <laughs> well, that has an impact on our representatives as well. I mean, from our mayor here all the way up to the president and everyone in between. Let's let them hear from us. Let's carve out time. Let's, what I'm reminded of is the, the woman in Proverbs 31. In the evening, she doesn't stop her work. She continues to work so that her family is well-clothed, well-fed, and warm, well-taken-care-of. 
can we take 15 minutes out in an evening instead of watching the television and writing our representative? But how, much, how many of us do, I even, do we even think to do that? But that wouldn't be so hard, just a little card. Pop a stamp on it, stick it in the mailbox, lift up the flag, and boom, it's done. But we don't think to do that. But that's our responsibility to do that. And if we're going to live in a free country, we have to undertake our responsibility. So should we write to all of them? Should we write to somebody every week? I do have up here, thanks to Miss Linda, um, a partial list. This is not the full. I'd hope to get everything for you, but I think you'll have to do some digging on your own. That's coming up. But I'm talking about direct contact here. No. Whoops, let me, sorry Bob. Um, so, nope, I am absolutely not going to tell you who to vote for. That's between you and God, and maybe your wife, and I'm neither of those people, so. <laughs> So that. This is uh, Texas State Senate members and U.S. House of Representative members for Texas. There you go, gentlemen. Uh, again, it's not everybody, but at least it's some. And so, if you'll share that with your neighbor. It's a good place to start. And all this is public information, so you can find it. It's a great website also. The senators have a website. Yes. So I would encourage you to then be informed of the issues and contact them when issues come up that you care about, which is probably all the time. And I know that actually takes some extra work as well, but that's actually doing something. So we're praying for our representatives, those that we've employed to work on our behalf to make a better community, a better nation on our behalf. So, But we need to pray for them and we need to instruct them because we're their bosses and we need to tell them if they're doing right or if they're doing wrong. And since we are their bosses, we need to vote. Because in the words of the Donald, if they're not doing the right, you're fired. <laughs> but before we can vote, we've got to register to vote. Yes? Last night, Ted Cruz said that there are 60 million Christians that do not vote. Exactly. And he said if just 10 million would go to the polls, the, the, you know, they would win. Yes. Just 10 million would vote. Exactly. So I was stunned at 60 million. And how many of those are registered to vote? Because that's the first step. You can't just show up on election day. I mean, we all know that. But so many people don't get around to voting, and then when election day comes up, oh, I never did register, and I can't do it because I got too busy. So first step is register. Let's make sure that we're registered and those around us, and if they're not registered, friend, close friends and family, let's bug them. That's something that we can bug them about. Is go get yourself registered to vote. It's easy. You can do it online. You don't even have to go to the courthouse. Get yourself registered. That's number one. Then vote. We have absolutely no right to complain, to criticize, if we don't vote. And a lot of the 60 million do complain. The ones that stay home on election day. But they'll be the first to go ahead and complain. Well, they have no right to. Be quiet. I don't want to hear from you. If you're not going to bother to vote, and with early ballot voting and uh, mail-in ballots, it's easy. It's easier than ever has been. So we have absolutely no right if we don't do that. I think that's one of the problems. It's people that can get in there and vote that don't even have a clue about what's going on. Right. And I've seen that over and over in reporters writing or congressmen and stuff like that. I've danced down that path before. And... Instead of answering a specific question, 
how they do their little political dance yeah. around it. Tell him, hold on just a second. Just answer the question. Mm -hmm. And I get the same dance. Yep. And it happened over and over and over again. Yep. But because this guy goes out and says a bunch of things, you know, about that people want to hear, they just keep putting him in office over and over yes. and over again. Yep. Exactly. And they're after the position. Some of these I know are after the position. I know some of them are doing their best. But it's like the Electoral College. As long as we've got and still doing this the way we're doing it, we're not <laughs> able to even elect those electors, we'll never have to say so in it. Yeah. And it's <clears throat> and I'm surprised they ain't got rid of that a long time ago. But when I've done my research around it, is to protect America from ignorant people who vote. <laughs> and how they, get office, how they get to be electors, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. You know, those are people are selected. Yeah. Not elected, but selected. selected. And they're yeah. the ones that have the final vote for president. Mm -hmm. And, uh, We've seen, we've seen it in the past, you yeah. know. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's back in the old days of uh, the, my, the one that sticks out in my mind is when Al Gore got the popular vote and yeah. uh, Bush got the tabs. <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the whatever. The, the, hanging <laughs> the hanging chads. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and say so we're we are reaping negligence for at least the last hundred years. It's just been slowly, slowly slipping away. It's been eroding out of our education system, so it's not in the forefront of young folks as they're growing up and being educated. So they don't see that is that's just part of daily life. That's part of my daily responsibilities, like brushing my teeth and saying my prayers is overseeing the process, being informed, knowing what's going on, letting them know what my opinion is, and then voting from an informed viewpoint. It all fits together. We can't just jump in at the end. We've got to collectively, as we the people, take all these steps and then we can correct the course and steer away from this iceberg that we're steaming towards, which is away from God. So voting is part, a very, very big part. But obviously we need to be informed, not just about the issues, but about the candidates themselves. Because they're all, I mean, it doesn't matter what side of the spectrum all, they're all just past masters at saying flowery words. And the Bible says, talks about tickling your ears, and they do. If I listen to Bernie Sanders, who's an avowed socialist, and I respect the fact that he's at least honest about what he is. Yeah, he is. I respect that in him. I don't agree with him, but I respect that. At least he's honest about who he is. And I think maybe some other people do uh, as well. But even he says some things that sound good. Because it's just kind of a broad generality. Oh, we need to help people. We can't leave people behind. Well, that's true, but that's not your job to fix and a lot of that is the church's job that we haven't been doing. And then we, a gap opens up and then those in government want to seize that opportunity, at least on the surface, say that they're addressing that problem. But speaking of voting, Noah Webster in 1789, who we've heard some before, made this quote, In selecting men for office, let principle be your guide. Regard not the particular sect or denomination of the candidate. Look to his character. This goes to the 60% who sit at home. Because how many Christians do we know that we've heard from directly say, well, I don't agree with this person all the way. Well, look at the alternative. 
Who do you agree with more? Because it's our responsibility to choose those that we send to office, from the mayor's office all the way to the U.S. president's office. And just as we are not perfect, they are not perfect. And we are, again, let's, let's keep this in mind. This is very important, very, very important. The, the crop of candidates that we have today and have had for the last couple of, several decades, I would say, are the result of the negligence that we've had, that the church has had in America for the last hundred some odd years. So we can't all of a sudden expect, oh, we're going to have St. Peter and St. Paul be running for president. When our system has drifted, the whole system that has generated the candidates has drifted so far off course. It takes a while. It's just like a huge ocean liner. It's not going to be a quick course correction like a little speedboat. And so we've got to start turning the wheel and turning the wheel and turning the wheel and the ship won't feel like it's turning yet. But eventually it will if we keep turning the wheel and keep to that right course. Because it's a big ship, 350 some odd million people. It's a big ship. But when we start working on that, and again, people like us are doing this all over the country. And don't give up and say, well, we tried it this cycle, it didn't work. No, we are reaping the results of generations. So we can't lose faith. We can't be impatient. And we can't expect perfect candidates. I wish we could. I would prefer that as well. But we need to find out what the candidates really stand for, get past all that flowery language business that we hear from every single one of them, and find out who they are as a person. What is their character? And then go out and vote. And if they're not that great, but it's the best alternative, let's go for that and start working on the next one. Because there's always another cycle. There's another cycle every two years. Uh, I understand presidents every four years, but we re elect representatives every two years. So it's a constant, ongoing process, and that's a good thing. That's one of the benefits of our system. We're not stuck with somebody for 12 years in a whack. And so we need to stay. It's a continuing process, continuing process. Just like we eat every day, we brush our teeth every day. We're continuing to select leaders and representatives every day. It's a continuing process, so we have to stay involved. We have to know about our candidates. But let us not ever have that excuse of sitting home because, well, I didn't quite agree with this person's theology. Then what are we going to have? Because those who don't follow God's ways, that want the state sovereign model, they're going to be motivated for their own reasons. And they will be out there and voting. So then what's the result? Henry, let me ask you, you can turn this to lady if you want. Do you think a candidate could tell the simple truth and be elected today? Uh, that is a good question, Jim. Um, I think there's probably many, many, many parts to that, meaning for each particular issue, how strong a truth are they able to tell. Um, I do believe that, that God honors telling the truth. God tells us clearly in His Word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I think there's a lot of hungry Americans out there that want to be told the truth about the issues. Uh, many feel like, for example, uh, that Donald Trump is speaking freshly and not using all the political jargon that's just a bunch of nonsense that has become the norm at all levels. And I'm not speaking on behalf of Donald Trump, don't get me wrong. But a lot of people feel that way. Like, oh, we're finally getting the truth. Now, whether it is or not <laughs> is another question. But I think the point is that there is a hunger out there for people to be told the truth. And just tell us what it is and not just a bunch of flowery, politically correct, blah, blah, blah. That means nothing. Absolutely nothing. So... I think that someone can get, they may be lambasted in the media because of the state of our media is very much in one direction. But I do think that we would be surprised when people start doing that. That doesn't mean that you use it as a bludgeon and start, and, and some people use the truth as, well, I'm just speaking the truth, but they're just bludgeoning everybody around them. And that's not smart. You've got to be, you have to use God's wisdom. Because... The Bible tells us to be crafty as serpents, but innocent as doves. 
So we have to be wise and operate according to our surroundings, but operating in truth, not compromising the truth ever. Uh, but be smart about the way we go about it, because there's more than one way to to say something that doesn't necessarily stomp on everybody's toes around you so that they can't even hear the truth because they're so offended. So, kind of a long-winded answer, but, but yeah, I, I think so. And, and I think once the church in America starts waking up again and people begin to see that who are maybe just kind of somewhere in the middle and they will become emboldened by the fact that, yes, candidates who are speaking the truth aren't going to get clobbered because they're lambasted in the media and so they get clobbered in the elections because they think, oh, they're not good because they're buying um, all the, the nonsense that the media spin puts out. People will be emboldened and say, yes, no, that is a, a candidate. I'm not going to believe all the dirt that's being slung at him or her because they are real person and they are telling the truth and they're a person of, of moral character and values and, and I can believe what they're saying and I'm not going to believe all the mudslinging and there will be mudslinging and especially if we're working on turning the ship back towards God's ways there'll be a lot of mudslinging and a lot of resistance from those who want to continue to go the other direction so it will be a fight it will be a lot of mudslinging and a lot of ugly words and things like that but the truth will win out and I believe there's still a majority of Americans that, that do want to see that. Yes? I have Jim's question. I, you know, I, I, at a national level, I'm not so sure you can find that right now because yeah. just, just the reasons you stated, but turning that ship has to start at the grassroots. And at the grassroots, I believe you can find some truths. Yeah. And some of the candidates locally, I think you can find yes. some truths. Yes, yeah. I agree. A lot of people Medicare, for example. Medicare will be broke before Social Security goes broke because medical costs are rising no matter what anybody does about it. The more people are signing up for it and the premiums don't cover it, then Uncle Sam is going into debt to pay for it. That's the honest truth. Now, people don't want to hear that because once you hear that, you got to do something about it. And what does that mean? Do I cut Medicare? Those of us that are on it don't want that. Uh, do I do I cut it for future people? The kids don't want that. And so once you go from the truth to what do we do about it, people don't like any of the choices. They just want to go, la, 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 everything will be okay, and <laughs> kick the can down the road. Yep. Well, we, we elected these people to make intelligent decisions for us. Instead of them leaving things alone, they, because of the national debt, they get into everything else, whether it be our gas tax, it's supposed to go for our roads and bridges and stuff like that, and they're using it to pay for something else. Yep. And uh, there's no accountability. We can't hold these people accountable once when they pass these laws that they start using this stuff. Once when they start using it, very, very rarely will they ever come back and change that. I've never heard of it ever going back and changing. Henry, do you think that if they put term limits on senators and representatives, they could stop a lot of this? I do, and I think that's an excellent proposal. Why do we have it for the president, but we don't have it for the representatives and senators? Because you get these people to get oh, rich. Oh, thank you. And all they're interested in is making millions of dollars. And how do they get rich? It's not from their salary. No. 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 And how are they able to hold down a full time job at home? when they're spending half the year in Washington. So, you know, something doesn't add up there, and it's obvious because where that's it was, coming from. Was set up the earthquake. People wasn't thought to be there for it, but they were no. going there, they were serving for a few months, going back home, and that was it. Yes. Now it's turned into somebody goes to Washington and never comes back home. Never comes back, no. It's not supposed to be an occupation. No, no, it's not. And you don't hear much about that anymore, right? Yeah. I think that would help. Oh, you. I absolutely should. But... But we all, we all have that power, though. We just don't use it because we can send them home. <coughs> we could cancel their term every, at the end of every, I mean, cancel their, their assignment at the end of every term and send them home. We can do that. But we don't because we're lazy. Yeah, I was going to say. We don't, but we can. We can, but. But if we start waking up and we start following these steps it's and. It's so hard to do that because there's so, <coughs> as DJ said, they're occupiers. Well, if they get in there from the state of Texas, say, for example, well, their main 
business is to see how much pork they can get back to Texas. Yeah. So, so the people who's getting all this from Texas, they will keep them in, even though they may be doing a poor job doing anything else. But hey, we get this bridge we needed and to nowhere over here somewhere in Texas. Then we have no right to complain. We have no right to criticize if we are looking for the benefit for ourselves because that pork is coming from somewhere. Yeah, and that's how they stay in office. So that's right. That's coming from someone else's pocket. Someone else's hard-earned tax money is going towards that, and there's just way, way, way too much. But again, we got we have to keep in mind we've we've had this enormous ship going in off drifting course, drifting course, drifting course for well over a hundred years now. We're not going to fix it right away. It may not even be in our lifetimes. But if we don't start it now, then the American experiment will end up as a failure. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want to see that. It's not the country that I grew up in. It's not the country that I know. It's not the country I love. And I don't want to see that. And I don't think that God wants to see that because He made us. He set, He fashioned us as a unique nation under God. This is a wonderful testimony of the entire world of God's blessings. And we don't want to be foolish like, bless our hearts, the children of Israel were over and over and over again. That's why we have the Bible, to learn these lessons so we don't have to experience it ourselves. It's not to sit back and scoff and say, huh, how stupid they were. No, or how stupid we. Yes, ma'am. You said it's been going on a different course for about 100 years. Roughly. It's just kind of a rough estimate. Can, but, can but, you sort of pinpoint <laughs> when it began? I'm still working on that. Um, I've been pondering this for years. Um, I used to think it was um, started around the, the 60s and there was a big turn at that point. Uh, but a big uh, portion of, of more of the socialist um, state sovereign model mindset actually entered in in the early 1900s. Um, and part of it was under the what was called the progressive movement in this country, uh, and the socialist or communists in um, uh, in Europe and uh, Eurasia, uh, and well, in um, uh, well in Central and South America as well. So uh, it's uh, it's been going on for quite some time. It's it's at loggerheads with what America was founded to be. Um, and but we have allowed it to be eroded and eroded and eroded, little bits by little bits, like a bunch of piranhas that are just kind of chewing away at at the America that was founded um, to remake it into something else. Well, Henry, would it be also when the country was formed as it went, we, as it's been going forward, we've lost more of the states' rights. Right. In which now we have more <clears throat> federal government than state. It was, essentially set up though with more states rights and now we've given up all that from the end of the civil war that from then on it's been more of a federal versus yeah. the states yeah and so the states have lost a lot of power they have and that was a big turning point as well because of very bad seeds that were sown at the founding mm -hmm. and allowing slavery to continue which set a course for a number of different issues that resulted in the civil war uh, but those were seeds that had been sown, and that was the uh, uh, the uh, the fruit that came as a result of it. And we're still reaping that today. We still have issues today uh, because of that, because of those bad seeds that were sown at that time. Um, and so, I, I can't answer your question exactly. And uh, it's it's an ongoing process to 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 do but because even even in the 16 and 1700s. Um, there was an ebb and flow when people, by and large, the population would uh, drift away from God and then they would be called back to God after a series of events. What is more concerning is that more recently in the last 50 to, at least in the last 50 or so years, when bad events happen, which they always have done throughout human history, we're not having the same reaction of let's return to God. And after 9-11, which was a horrific event here, there was only a momentary blip of returning to God. Churches were being filled for the first time in a long time. But they didn't last very long. Unlike previous times, when something big happened, whether it was the Great Depression, World War I, World War II, people returned to God in droves, and God blessed the nation. 
because they followed 2 Corinthians 7.14. We humbled ourselves before God. We turned from our wicked ways, and He healed our land. But now we're not turning to God. We're not humbling ourselves. We were proud as a nation. American exceptionalism. We're the best and strongest people on earth. Well, not because of us. What good we have is because God has blessed us abundantly, way more than we deserve. But if we're going to be prideful and we'll forget that, it'll be just like the folks at the Tower of Babel. And what happened to them? We won't be any different. If God's anointed chosen people of Israel were sent into Babylonian captivity and then later just disbanded altogether for 2,000 years, are we any different? No. Not one bit. We're all the same before God. And we talked about that in one of our early lessons about our equality before God. God does not differentiate. We are all the same. If we obey Him, we will be blessed by Him. If we don't, then we will eventually suffer His result. It's like you said the first Judgment. part. Uh, when you talk about how busy people are. People are just, they got so much going on, can't figure out what they've done at the end of the day. And what I found out is young people, the majority of the time, they've got so much going on, they don't have time for God. Yeah. And it's, when they don't have time, they don't have that idle time, it's, they don't know what they've done with their time. Yeah. God has never, even though we brought them up in church, raised them all throughout there, it seems like that uh, they just don't have the time. They are just busy. And most of them are, are split families and stuff like right. that. Right. And uh, it's, they are consumed with the amount of work they do, whether it be working at, the, at their job, doing their things they have to do at home to keep up the house and stuff like that. It's, uh, I'm not making excuses for them, but it seems like that back in our day when we was growing up, we always had that time. Right. We always had the family time. Right. We always had time for church. And uh, we just don't see that in our, our children and grandchildren now. Well, and speaking of grandchildren... I'm alarmed to see how many people I know personally where grandparents are raising their grandchildren. It's a phenomenon in our nation. In fact, your your kids, you can keep them on until they're 26 years old on your insurance. Yeah. But what's happened to the the parents of today, though? It's like they've just disappeared. They've just vanished, and, and the grandparents are raising their kids. And so in their 60s and 70s and 80s, we're going to raise the little ones. And, and to me, that's, that's a huge red flag for the health of our nation. Because that, that shouldn't be. It's great that grandparents are involved with their children and their children's children. And if they have a long enough life, their children's children, their great child, grandchildren. And that's wonderful. And that's the way it should be. But when you've lost a whole generation, that's alarming. And like I said, I know personally a lot. And so, yes. And are they so busy they can't raise their own children? I mean, there's a million reasons. So I'm not, I'm not saying that is, is critical to individuals. But us as a nation, that is a big indicator of our spiritual health. And therefore, it's being manifested in these different ways. That's one of the many ways that that's, that's an indicator of we're not right with God because our nation, we don't have the right priorities. So are we so busy because we have to be? Or we've just allowed our society to go in that direction? But don't we have the choice? Yeah. Didn't God tell us, choose life? Choose, this, this is not life. That generation is just out of pocket. They are just have chosen a lifestyle to, that's different. But that's tomorrow's leaders. Yeah. It's yes. sad. Yeah, it's but the, today's but the, voters. But the church is <laughs> if they show up. <laughs> the church is broken because of the families are torn apart and divorce is rampant. And so you've got all these, these kids out here divorced once or twice and with different kids from different fathers yes. and it's chaotic yes and we have kids that have been divorced and i know it, it, you've got all these different families grafted in and the time that's it, it and i don't know how the nation can heal without an individual without, without like you said helping yourself and pray i don't see our nation healing without the family coming back together Absolutely. I mean, that was the first institution that God created was the family. Yeah, and, that's and, right. and that is a, a, a very 
sad, very uh, concerning byproduct of all the choices that we've been making for quite some time. Well, you know, for a long time. time. For a lot of those things, though, people make excuses now for everything. Right. There's no consequences for living that way. Yeah. There's always the con well, he didn't, he couldn't help it. There's no yeah. consequences no to anything you do. And the churches are not standing up in, in saying there is consequences yeah. to the way right. you live. You know, they don't even, you know, there's a lot of things that you see. A lot of the churches, it's all come in, feel good, and you'll get rich. If you right. believe in what we right. preach. Right. But all I'll teach the other part of it. There's consequences if you don't believe. But all this reflects back to our, our problem we're having today with our nation and God. Right. And our voting deal. It's, it all boils down to this right here. It's, it's so much different direction that people are going. And it seems like that this group, our age group here is the only fabric we have left. I just can't see it in the upcoming generation. In the past few elections, you know, with these people who are voting just because they had that capability and just because our president, a nominee is black, we're all going to vote for him. And uh, they have, you know, it just seems like it was just... Whatever was easiest to do, it just seemed like everybody was just going along. Following. I think that's why God calls us sheep. Yeah. We just all in a flock and we all just follow. And, and that seems to be human nature. It's yeah. I mean, around the world, it's that's human nature. Changed. We all start going over the cliff right. and then people will come back. Right. Almost every time there's a yeah, great awakening, the there was a great problem. That exactly. Goes with it. Exactly. Because people, if they can get by, they right. get by. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because human beings are, that's the way they're, and they're lazy. By, by the nature, I mean, when you really boil it down to it, it's just being lazy. When you finally want to have water, you go check your well. You right. Don't check, head you don't check it and make sure it stays <laughs> maintained. Wait till it runs out. Now yeah. you got a problem. Yeah, then you got a problem. Exactly. Well, we could talk about the different symptoms till midnight. Um, but, and we're all very well aware of that. The point of, of our time together that we've spent for the last four months is talking about what are the solutions. And those aren't, they're not easy fixes and they're not overnight, but it's God's prescription to heal what ails us in this country. And we're seeing it. We've all lived long enough that we're seeing that things are out of balance from how they should be, from how God intended them. I mean, as long as we live on earth, it'll think, it was, this will not be the Garden of Eden. We were kicked out of the Garden a long time ago. It's not going to be perfect. But there's a huge difference. There's all the difference in the world, whether you're living right with God, experiencing some tribulations, but overcoming with God, versus getting on a worse and worse track that just leads to destruction. There's all the difference in the world. And we as Christians know that. And so, are we going to follow God's prescription? Are we going to listen to God's ways? Inform ourselves of His ways. Inform ourselves of the issues. Know about the candidates that we're hiring to represent us. Are we going to be involved? Are we going to find out about these people individually and to the extent that we can't, are we going to help them? Because as you said earlier, Bob, it's going to start at the grassroots, and I completely agree with you. Because those who are at the national level have come up from the grassroots, and they've been in the system for a very, very long time. There is beginning to be a new generation of people who want to be in leadership, who are more in line with, with God's viewpoint on things. And those are the people we need to identify, and we need to help them. You know, whether that's just manning the phones for a few hours once during their campaign, if we can afford to, give them a little something. Call them up and say, I'll put a yard sign in my yard. I'll put a bumper sticker. Whatever it may be, just some small way to be able to help candidates that we've identified that are God-fearing people, good moral character. That's our responsibility. We can't complain about our leaders if we don't try to identify and help the people that we want to hire that we want to send to office, whether it's at the city hall here in Fredericksburg, whether it's in Austin, Texas, or whether it's in Washington, D.C. We need to identify those people. And today's grassroots leaders are tomorrow's national leaders. 
and we can identify them and support them all the way through. And when they go off track, we can hold them to account and say, hey, I've been a supporter of yours for the last 10 years. I saw you when you were just a city councilman. Hey, knock it off. Don't let Washington corrupt you like it's corrupted some other, so many other people. Oh, that's neat. It's that good, is neat. Yeah. It's a good side benefit. You don't it is. It really is, Bob. It really is. Thank you for sharing that. Well, finally, question before us. Do we want to undertake the work it's going to take and the responsibility to govern ourselves, or do we want to be lazy and be governed? Because that's really what it all boils down to. We can listen to all this and understand it intellectually, maybe even be touched spiritually. But in the end, it comes down to this question. Do we want to say, yes, God, I understand what you're saying. I understand how this is supposed to work according to your word, according to the scriptures that we've looked at, according to the inspiration that you have founded this nation upon? Do I want to take, undertake my responsibility to continue to live in a God-fearing free nation as it has been for so long? Or do I not? Do I want to go with the current trend of sheep or river that's going to go off a cliff into oblivion? Do I want to be lazy and be governed by whoever has the loudest voice in the media? If what we're saying is true that we have been trending, to use a current term, off track for some time and a little bit leads to a little bit more leads to a little bit more and after a while that leads to a whole lot because it's the proverbial eating an elephant it wasn't eaten in one bite it's been nibbled away and nibbled away for decades if that's the case then it's not going to turn around overnight are we going to dedicate the rest of our lives to knowing God's principles, to sharing that with others, to teaching our children, to teaching the next generation, to praying for our families to turn around, praying that God will touch their hearts, praying for our leaders, to involve ourselves in the process, maybe even run for something like city council or county commission, to be a judge. Any number of different ways, that's between you and God, but for us to be involved, to all have a role. Because we, every single American citizen has a role. We all have a part to play. Every one of us. And that's, we have forgotten. We have forgotten. So the tenth and final point is decide to do it. Are we going to decide to do it? Or are we just going to say, no, that was, all, that was interesting, Henry, but I'm going to go on and not make any kind of changes in my life. I don't think you would be sitting here, and you would have been sitting here for the last four plus months, if that's the way you felt. And I don't feel that way. So I will be seeking God to find out how better I can be involved. Hit the wrong button here. And remember, at the end of the day, the words of John Quincy Adams, duty is ours. Results are God's. So if we are doing what we're supposed to do before the Lord, and we know with a clear conscience we're doing all God has called us to do, then we rest in Him and knowing that the result is God's. And He can do so much more than we can do. We can't figure this out in our minds. Logically, I can't figure out how we're going to change things and reverse all these very concerning, very alarming trends that we're seeing across our nation. I can't do it myself, and I don't know how us as human beings... It doesn't seem likely to change course. But that's leaving God out of the equation. Because God can do mighty things. God is still on the throne. And if He's not, then we, <laughs> we have no hope. But we know that He is on the throne. He is King of the universe. He is Lord of lords and God of all. And therefore, if we humble ourselves, if we follow His ways... He will turn this ship around. And many people in this nation and around the world will be blessed by that. And that will be an incredible thing.
So it is not for us to decide the times in which we live. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. <laughs> From Lord of the Rings. We didn't choose when to be born, but if we, every one of us was uniquely made in God's image, in a different aspect of God's image, then don't you think God chose for when, us to be, for when we, each of us would be born as well? He knew we would be born now. Not in the 40s or in the 1770s or any other time in history, but right now. So if we're born right now for a reason, then we have a job in this generation. So all we have to decide is what to do with the time that has given us. However long that may be. Could be one more day, could be 10 years, could be 20 years, 50 years, I don't know. None of us know. But for the time that we're here, let's honor God. Because in the word of Mordecai, talking to Esther, and who knows that you were not born for such a time as this. That you were not put in the position where you are. And we're all in different positions here. We may be working at the high school and with the youth. Or many different other positions that God has caused us to be in so that we can have an impact. And our little group here, no, we can't change the whole nation. But we can do our part of it and leave the results to God. So with that, it will conclude this class. I want to thank you again. Um, and if we can uh, just close with a word of prayer here. And then I've got a second round of snacks. So, <laughs> so don't rush off as I want to fatten you up before you go. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. We thank you, Lord, for causing us to be born in such a time as this. Lord, you knew in your sovereign wisdom when we would be born, the situation that we would be born into, and the state of our nation today in 2016. And Lord, you've awoken our hearts to yearn for you, to hunger for you, hunger for your word, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our minds and help us to grow in this knowledge of you, Lord, and so that we would utilize your word, your truths, Lord, to set ourselves free and our families, our friends, our community, our nation, Lord. And Lord, may you bless this nation. May all the hearts of the people humble themselves before you, Lord. And may we return to you, Lord, we ask. Forgive us, Lord, our many sins in this nation. Forgive us, Lord, for being stiff-necked and hard-hearted. And we pray that you would continue to touch hearts, just like the folks that are here in this room today, that you would touch hearts of people all across this nation. And we, Lord, we know that you are, and we're so encouraged by that. May you show us all, Lord, your truth, Lord, how to follow you, Lord, and how to be a benefit, how to love our neighbors as ourselves, Lord, in doing so to bless this nation. And in this nation, we can bless all the peoples of the world because you have caused us to do so. You have blessed us so much, Lord. May we regain the right track in you, and may you continue to bless this nation. May you continue to raise up a new generation of leaders, Lord, that fears you, Lord, that loves you and will follow you and will not be corrupted by the world's ways. Lord, may we do our part in supporting them. May we do our part, Father, in encouraging them and providing a base, Lord, that, that they can fall back on, Lord, when they, they hit those hard times and they hit the resistance. Lord, we know this is a big ship, but you are a much bigger God. So we turn this nation over to you. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon it. And I pray, Lord, for your blessing upon all the people here gathered in this room. May you bless them and their families. May they go in peace and safety tonight. And may you be with them and bless them all throughout their lives. And continue to bless them as they follow you and serve you. And as they love you, Father, and love their neighbors as themselves as you've told us to do. Lord, we thank you for all these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Yannick. We really enjoyed it.